Cool. Um, let's uh, let's kick this off. So thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, fast, simple concurrency with Scala Native. Um, Scala Days is extra amazing this year, and it's um, it's an honor to be here with all of y'all. So this is a talk about um, bare metal concurrency on Scala Native, um, and what that really means is it, to me, it gets to the heart of what the the native platform is and what makes it different from Scala on the JVM or even Scala on um, JavaScript. Um, but because this is a platform where you you start off with less, it's to me it's really about Scala as a platform itself. If you're doing Scala all the way down to the OS level, um, you, you you have nothing but Scala in your stack, which can be intimidating but also be really exciting. Um, and to me, it's especially about sustainable libraries and communities. How do we build enough functionality on this new platform to sort of bootstrap a workable ecosystem where you can start using this in production? Um, concretely, though, this is a talk about Native Loop, which is uh, the new concurrency library for Scala Native 0.4. Um, it's an extensible um, event loop and I.O. system. Um, it's backed by LibUV, a C library uh, that provides an event loop that I'll talk a lot more about uh, shortly. And it works great with other C libraries, uh, things you've heard of like libcurl, um, and uh, really easy to extend. Um, and it's here on GitHub. It lives in the main Scala native organization, um, but it's not merged into the core yet. It's still provided as a library. And with the techniques I'm showing you here, anyone could build uh, their own um, concurrency system if they wanted to, which is one of the things that's most exciting about Scala Native, um, for me anyway. Um, so what, what's in this talk? Um, we're going to start with like a slide or two about concurrency in Scala, just for background. Um, we're going to talk about Scala Native on background, and then LibUV. Um, then we're going to do an overview of the high-level API. Um, and then we're actually going to do a deep dive into the execution context itself, um, and then conclude by just talking about where we go. So about me, um, I'm Richard Whalen. Um, I've been writing Scala for pro about 10 years or something, but uh, full time, more like four or five. Um, I'm a data engineer at M1 Finance in Chicago. If you haven't heard of us, we're a fintech startup. We provide banking and brokerage services. Um, we have about 100,000 happy users and manage about half a billion dollars in assets. We're hiring back in Scala engineers in the US. And if you want to hear more about it, just come up and talk to me afterwards. I would love to tell you about it. Um, I'm also the author of this book, Modern Systems Programming with Scala Native, um, which is available um, in digital preview now from Pragmatic um, here. And not only that, I actually have a, a discount code right here for it. Um, and also, if you, you buy the beta release, you get the full book now. All 10 chapters are there. And probably around the end of the summer, um, when I finish the book and revise it for 0.4, you'll, um, you'll get all the updates to your e-copy, and you'll get a huge discount on buying a paper copy. Um, and I'll tweet, the, tweet this out and uh, show the code again at the end. Um, but yeah, let's get started. Um, so yeah, let's talk about concurrency really quickly. So I'll, I'll just throw out some definitions. Programs that do one thing at a time we'll call synchronous. And programs that do more than one thing at a time we can call asynchronous or concurrent. Um, synchronous programs are generally easier to write, but they do bottleneck or block on certain workloads. Um, whereas concurrent programs can perform better, um, but also can be fiendishly complex and buggy. Um, I'd argue Java and C++ more or less got it wrong. Um, and some JavaScript uh, probably got it right in, in some sense, although they certainly continue to evolve, as do we all. Scala, of course, famously um, has made uh, huge advances in concurrency for the whole lifetime of, of Scala, really. Um, the heart of it really is the, the Scala.concurrent API, and in particular, the, the future and execution context it provides. It lets you do things more or less like this. Um, where uh, a future passes the, the asynchronous result of a computation. Um, ideally, there's no mutable and sta state involved. Everything is passed around in these futures. And you have this implicit execution context that lets you abstract over different backends. That can be a thread pool, that can be a dedicated background thread, that can be on your main thread. Um, and this, this abstraction over the exact mechanism of execution is something that I still think makes makes Scala really special. It's things that Go and JavaScript don't let you do, right? And it's the, that um, sort of modularity is what makes this whole talk even possible. Um, that said, concurrency is still difficult. Um, 
right? If you do run blocking code, it's really easy to starve the, the execution context of threads um, accidentally. It's easy to run into race conditions. If you do have mutable state, I've certainly accidentally closed over Cinder and an actor uh, probably dozens of times. Um, and people try to solve this by introducing higher level models, actors, streaming, um, a lot of the newer stuff people are talking about um, here at this conference. But um, we, Problems do persist. It's still hard, right? And I'm going to argue that the, the JVM's threading and memory model is sort of fundamentally hostile to, to, to closures in general, right? Um, and to some extent, thus to Scala. Um, and I, but I, I don't think it's controversial to just point out that a huge proportion of JVM libraries will happily block your threads. And there's uh, good reasons not to rely on those. I thought um, Rob Norris's talk yesterday uh, made this point much more strongly than I ever could. Um, highly recommend that if you didn't get to see it. Um, so the design questions for, for us going into like what we want concurrency to look like on Scala native, you know, we, we, can't, um, we can't piggyback on what worked for the JVM, but we also aren't constrained by it. Um, we, can, we can start over from scratch. Um, so the question for me is whether um, Scala Native can provide a model of IO and concurrency that's true to Scala, but I, I kind of hope that it could provide a model of IO and concurrency that's, that's more true to Scala than the JVM ever was, that, that Scala without the Java-isms can, can be more Scala. Um, so let's, let's talk about Scala Native for a bit before we go any deeper. So Scala native is, is Scala. It's not a, a fork. It's a compiler plugin, just like Scala JS. Um, instead of targeting um, JVM bytecode, it targets the LLVM compiler backend, same compiler framework that Rust, Clang um, use. Um, so it produces um, basically compact, optimized native binaries with a small footprint and a low memory overhead. You don't have a JVM, um, but you do have pretty good coverage of JDK classes because we've re-implemented a good portion of the JDK in pure Scala, right? So ordinary Scala code, for the most part, just works. Um, but you get other cool things with Scala Native 2 that I think are really special. Um, you get full control over memory allocation, like you'd have in a C program. You get struct and array out primitives for off-heap memory, uh, like you'd have in a C program. You get CFFI, this really uh, foreign function interface, the ability to call into C libraries and also to pass your own code into them. Um, I started my career as a C programmer, and I've been doing CFFI from a lot of languages for a long time. And Scala Natives is the, the best I've ever seen. I really fell in love with it the first time I, I started using it. Um, all of this adds up to basically an unembedded Scala DSL with the capabilities of C, with all the power and danger that go with that. And to me, that's immensely exciting and powerful. Um, so that, that also comes with a warning, right? This is very low-level computing. Um, it's powerful, but it's also dangerous. Um, you don't need any unsafe functionality to use Scala native. Um, and sort of the best practice as a, that we've settled on as a community over the last two years is that you want what we want to provide are safe, idiomatic Scala APIs on top of the, the low-level code. So really, um, library authors um, and sort of um, language maintainers are really the people who should have to worry about the, the unsafe stuff, not end users, who should really just see ordinary Scala. Um, but what even is idiomatic Scala when, when you really open this up, right? Scala native is, is single-threaded, um, and the, the JDK isn't complete. There are things that are missing, like reflection, like runtime class loading. Um, so you, you fill in the gaps by, by using the CFFI. They're awesome C libraries for <laughs> everything under the sun, just about everything the JVM can do, and a lot of cool things the JVM can't do. Um, so then the question is, do we pick these off one at a time, or do we try to make a bolder move to provide the essential capabilities that we need to write productive Scala code? Um, and from there, uh, I think originally about two years ago, I just started experimenting with um, a C library called LibUV. Um, this is a cross-platform C library that provides an event loop. Um, it's famously used by Node.js and was originally spun out of the Node.js project, but it's also used by, by Julia, by NeoVim, and as a library in Ruby, Python, Perl 6, all kinds of things. Um, it has great um, non-blocking I.O. capabilities. Um, and it supports Windows, Mac, and BSD, which is r really great. Um, so it's, it's a, I think, it's just 
off the looking at the, the, the label on the can, it's a great fit for Scala Native. Um, so what, what it does is that it abstracts both over different kinds of I.O. Um, and different operating system mechanisms that underlie it. Um, and per, like uh, Linux famously has this ePoll mechanism for, for async I.O. that's quite fast but quite painful. BSD has KQ. Um, Windows has I.O. completion ports. Um, but even then, like uh, in Linux, ePoll works on TCP sockets and pipes, um, but it actually doesn't work on file I.O. And um, on most file systems, file I.O. is always blocking in Linux, which is kind of fiendish. Um, so what LibUV does is it actually has um, a thread pool um, separate from the main single-threaded event loop where it will run um, any blocking system calls for things like file I.O., for things like DNS. Um, and in theory, it can also run um, user code um, also, actually. So you even get that thread pool functionality for free. Um, and it provides all of this with a really consistent API where any resource you can do something to, whether it's, um, whether it's an IO um, resource or just sort of a lifecycle hook, is represented by a handle, and then you just pass a C function into the C library calls um, to use as a callback when, when different events happen, um, essentially. Um, so the way that works out with Scala Native is that our Scala Native code will just run on a single thread, um, we'll be able to use uh, ePoll, et cetera, for high-performance I.O. on whatever um, operating system we're using that's totally abstracted for us. We get this gr pretty good callback API, and we get sort of production-grade performance for free, um, and also a lot of really good patterns for extending this with other C libraries with async capabilities. Um, I've done curl so far, but there's even like um, sample code out there for, for getting like Postgres clients and Redis clients and other things integrated. Um, um, but the, 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 the big question is one of design and whether <laughs> if we're using um, this sort of low-level Node.js library, if we can avoid um, <laughs> the, the callback hell or pyramid of doom um, anti-pattern that JavaScript code had, you know, five, ten years ago. Um, so, yeah, let's just actually talk about where the API is, though, um, and then we'll cut back to actually how we implement something that's, that's more idiomatic. So, first of all, um, we're going to have a real execution context and real futures. Um, I, I'm not comfortable with a Node.js style API in Scala. Um, we're going to have pretty comprehensive I.O. capabilities, get, uh, get all the basics handled. Um, we're going to provide an HTTP and HTTPS client server. And honestly, those are more important to me than file I.O., right? When was the last time I wrote a I wrote output to a file from a Scala program. I don't even know. Um, I think they're really like the, the price of entry um, nowadays. Um, but it's to provide all of this with a sense of um, minimalism and sustainability, right? The functionality we're talking about here is potentially enormous. Um, and just trying to get something that works um, and gets us to sort of useful production grade programs as, as quickly as possible is the most important thing here. Um, the meta goal for me is um, rather than to design like a state-of-the-art API is to provide an unopinionated, unopinionated base for the other idioms that are always rapidly evolving. Things like streams, like the actor model, like the various IO monad implementations, right? Um, which uh, turns out to be pretty tricky, but I'll, I'll show you what I've got so far. Um, so the, for the event loop, um, basically we have a trait for event loops, which just extends execution context, um, and it adds two capabilities. Um, it adds this um, loop extension mechanism, which I'll show you more about shortly, um, but that's basically how you'll register other modules and other C libraries with it. Um, so even third-party libraries can integrate with the event loop and synchronize with it. Um, but it also exposes the low-level libuv um, loop primitive. Um, and then it has this loop.run method, which is what we can use to actually um, yield to the event loop um, and start actually doing I.O. Unlike traditional Scala single-threaded execution context, we aren't eagerly executing futures um, as soon as they're ready. Instead, we um, basically defer them to the point in our life cycle where we sort of um, pin all future execution. Um, so this, this, is, this ends up being like medium intrusive, but we can also talk about ways to, to um, streamline that. And I've got a Scala native issue open to just let the, um, basically to let the Scala native runtime um, hook into this or other um, supplied libraries that, that can provide an event loop. 
Um, so for, for an example of some of these loop extensions and capabilities, uh, the simplest one would just be like a timer or delay or schedule, right? Um, so we can have an, a really simple API like this where you just give it a duration. Um, it returns a future of unit after that duration. Um, it can do repeating schedules, so it can be a really nice primitive for building your own scheduler. Um, and of course, this we're not even we're not even touching the the future class, right? We're the only thing we're doing is supplying an execution context. So regular map, flat map, um, all of the different callbacks and combinators just just work for free. Um, um, this was my, my first attempt at streams. This is what's in the book right now, um, but I actually consider this design a failure. I tried to do something very like reactive stream style, and what I found was it was really um, tricky to model raw sockets um, or files well. Files in particular have this notion of um, position and seekability that reactive streams doesn't model and demand doesn't really make sense, um, whereas sockets are bi-directional and sort of demand can, can flow in both directions and change state. Um, so sort of based on specific protocol implementations. Um, so that, that turned out to be really tricky to do with a sort of purely reactive streams um, mechanism. So when I redesigned this for 0.4, the goal was actually to, to streamline it, to simplify it, and again, to provide this sort of unopinionated uh, base layer um, for things like reactive streams, Monix, Cat's Effect, Zio, um, and sort of punt that to the, the experts. Um, so what we've got now is <laughs> much, much simpler. It's um, much closer to just a sort of direct exposure of all of LibUV's capabilities, um, including pausing, which is really important. The, the idea is, I don't, for now, I'm actually not implementing back pressure on my side of this. Instead, I'm just exposing um, a pause method that would allow um, a layer on top of this to implement back pressure. But the cool thing is, because this is a totally safe, idiomatic Scala API with no C functions or pointer arithmetics, it's a lot easier for um, someone else to come in and implement any IO um, idiom they, they want. I think it's quite likely that after we've gone through the experience of porting some like IO monads um, to this, we might decide to have a higher level API baked in down the road. Um, but for now, I think this is the, the right base to move forward um, rapidly. Um, it's also not, basically not typed. It strings in, strings out is um, sort of what IO speaks. Um, and for now, I think that's actually uh, safer than trying to, to, com to, to define complicated type signatures. Um, likewise, the real question I had here is whether I should even um, sort of bind future into the, the low-level API signature or whether I should entirely work with callbacks um, to allow us to implement like an IO monad without um, having to bother um, allocating futures at all. Um, I think, that, again, that's something that'll come out in the wash once we've actually had more experience implementing these things. But it's a really interesting um, and definitely the most experimental part of what I'm going to show you today. Um, in contrast, things like curl, the, the famous libcurl C library, um, and it's incredibly comprehensive, is pretty, pretty simple by comparison. Um, it does what it says. <laughs> we get this really um, awesome, highly scalable um, HTTP and HTTPS client. Um, it does a great job integrating with with LibUVs, polls, and timers. It has great um, HTTPS support. And I don't know if anyone's ever tried to implement HTTPS from scratch, but it's hard. <laughs> so the fact that we get it for free is amazing. It also supports like 20 other protocols, like FTP and SCP and IMAP. Um, my goal, though, again, is not to like design an API for this myself, but to like get support for STDP or um, request Scala and things like that that I think do a really, really great job of this. Um, and then I can just punt the the API design. the The harder problem there, though, is whether there is like a, a primitive low level API that we could all agree on, right? Um, which I, I don't think we have yet. Um, in contrast, uh, for the the ser HTTP server API, um, we actually have two different, we actually have two clear layers here, right? Um, we have this imperative server API um, where you just serve on a port and then have a handler that 
every time a request comes in, the handler gets called with both the request and the connection object. And the idea is the connection object is basically a proxy that provides the capability to respond. And by providing that capability, rather than like taking a either a future of request onto response or future of request onto or a function of request on a future response, we can totally abstract over that and allow a middleware um, layer above this to, to decide what types to plug in um, entirely. Um, and uh, I'll show you in the next slide. It's like if you want to get started writing a server DSL on top of this with like routers and stuff like that, it's like 50 lines of code or something with like JSON and stuff like that. Um, again, in the interest of punting on API design, I'd be really interested to see we can even avoid um, imposing a request and response type. The ideal thing would be if Scala had a lightweight HTTP server middleware standard, like Ruby has Rack and Scala has WSGI. Scala has servlets, but frankly, I think they're way too heavyweight. Um, a lightweight servlet style API designed for Scala, I think, would be a really healthy thing for the whole ecosystem. I suggest we call them Scalets. Uh, any takers on that? No? OK, I tried. Um, so, yeah, so if you have like 45 minutes, you can build a simple server DSL on top of it that looks more like this. Um, and I'm actually going to ship this in the, the first published version of the library. Um, so you can just get like uh, synchronous and asynchronous request handlers. Getting JSON support baked in is pretty easy because we've got, we've got two working um, JSON libraries on Scala Native. We've got Argonaut and Spray JSON right now, I think. Um, this router is rudimentary, but they're really good ones we could port over. Um, Cask is awesome. Um, Play's routing um, DSL, CERD, is surprisingly um, compact and isolated, and I think you could port it over pretty, pretty quickly, and that would be really fun and a, a huge win. Um, and because all of the capabilities I've showed you over these last five slides are all running on the same event loop and coordinated by libuv, you can mix and match all of these um, seamlessly. And once you have right, uh, a web server that can take asynchronous request handlers um, and a web client that returns futures, you have the basics for a for distributed systems in a modern environment. Um, and it, it just works. Um, which gets really exciting. Um, but if, if we're going to talk about distributed systems, we should also talk about performance, right? Um, so I, the, like the first time I gave a talk about Scala Native two years ago at Strange Loop, I was all about having like land speed record performance graphs and stuff like that. Um, what I found is that they aren't super representative of actual application behavior. In reality, modern server side backend applications are much more likely to bottleneck on their backing data store, not on pushing through HTTP requests, right? That said, I am uh, load testing this code base with Gatling quite regularly. And what I'm aiming for is high hundreds, low thousands of requests per second on benchmarks um, with a good quality of service, trying to do a little bit better than Node.js. Um, but the, the real impact is um, actually on service density, right? Scala native is seriously lightweight. Um, all of these instances will be running on less than one CPU core. They take 100 to 200 megabytes of RAM. The binary footprint is often less than 10 megabytes versus like realistic JVM like Akka or Play microservices where you're talking two to four CPU cores or more. You're talking at least a gigabyte of RAM, realistically, if not two to four is what a lot of my services run on in prod, and like a 10 times larger like disk footprint, if not worse. Um, and like if you're in a real world scenario, like let's say you have like eight clustered microservices, you have three to five instances of, of each of those, um, maybe at worst two of those eight services actually run at like 100% saturation under peak load. You've got a system where you have a lot of idle resources and you're paying for all of this, um, this overhead, uh, the, the JVM um, sort of taxes out of you. And that, that really adds up. Um, and I think Scala Native's like, tiny footprint really makes it suited economically to the, the modern style of like, small um, distributed services. Um, don't even get me started about how great it is for serverless, where you pay for the, the, the basically megabyte of memory times seconds. It's outstanding and serverless. Uh, I wish I could give a whole talk on that. Um, but yeah, so that's that's sort of the high level. Let's um, let's let's go deep. We've got we're doing great on time, so let's let's do it. Um, so to do this, we're going to need two unsafe techniques from systems programming. We're going to need pointers 
and we're going to need unsafe casts, right? So um, high level uh, pointer is a representation of the location of a piece of data. Basically, you represent an address in memory as an 8-byte unsigned integer uh, equivalent to a long. So like a pointer t is the address of a value of some type t. Um, you can think of it as being like a mutable cell for a value, right? Um, and it can feel a little ungainly, but there's something about that that's almost more elegant than Scala's var, right? If you look at um, other strict functional programming languages like standard ML and OCaml, they tend to use like mutable cell containers um, for, for things like this, and it can be really elegant, actually. Um, and then an unsafe cast is really just a C programming technique where you have a pointer T and you just make a compile time claim. This isn't a pointer T. This is a pointer to X. I know what I'm doing. And um, uh, it often works. So you can treat a pointer as any other pointer type, and when necessary, you can just cast the pointer to a long and sort of YOLO it, um, which can be scary, uh, but um, powerful, right? C famously has no um, generic programming um, mechanisms, unless you count macros, and I definitely don't count C macros. Um, but C has void pointers, basically pointers to a whatever or to any. Um, and it's really common for C libraries that are designed for generic programming um, to, to just provide sort of a wild card void pointer field in their data structures where you, the user, can just sort of throw in a pointer to whatever data structure you want. Um, and in Scala native, we'll represent these void pointers as just a pointer to byte. It's just the address of a binary blob somewhere. We don't know how many bytes it is, but we know where it is, and that, as we'll see, is, is enough. Um, so in, in practice, it looks like this. Um, so if you want to get a pointer, there's a few ways you can get them, but the best way is, is malloc. That's not a Scala native intrinsic. That's me calling the C standard lib malloc, literally. And, I, and the way it works is you tell it how many bytes you want, which I'm, giving, I'm asking it for a size of long bytes, which is eight for the record. And what it returns is uh, just a, it, retor it returns a void pointer in C. So it just says, okay, here's a pointer back to a byte somewhere. Um, it doesn't even, um, malloc doesn't even natively track um, the, the type that you've asked it for. Um, so on line three, this is the first time we do an unsafe cast, because just allocating type to memory requires a cast, right? So we're doing raw data dot as instance of pointer long. Um, which uh, then just asserts, right, there's no computation um, associated with that, that it's actually a, a pointer to a long. The other thing, if anyone's used malloc, is malloc returns uninitialized memory, which is quite scary to us as Scala programmers. It might be zeroed, or it might be just have garbage data from the last, um, the last uh, piece of code to use it. So we want to... Um, we want to initialize it. So the way you initialize it is just by um, setting the value to zero, and that's what we're doing on line six. The way we both set and dereference pointers in Scala native is with the prefix exclamation mark or bang operator. Um, if anyone's done this in standard ML, it's pretty similar syntactically. Um, so the idea is if you use um, exclamation mark on the left-hand side of an assignment, it's an update operator and just stores the value into the pointer. And if you use it on the right-hand uh, side or just an expression position, right, then it's a dereference. It returns the value stored um, at, in the pointer, right? So like on line 10 where I'm starting to like print these, I can print both um, the pointer itself long pointer as well as its value, which is bang long pointer. So the ability to distinguish data from its address is something that's basically impossible um, in a, in, when, you're, when you have a garbage collector to deal with or, or in Java, right? Um, but is also immensely powerful. Um, and then let's say we want to update it. We can do that again on line 11. We can print it again. And then, of course, uh, with malloc, you're responsible for the memory you're using. Your garbage collector won't claim it back for you. So if you don't free it, it leaks. Um, we let it go with free. But then if we uh, mistakenly um, try to read it again after we free, we, we could get a seg fault, um, which will just 
blow up our program without a stack trace, or you could accidentally corrupt your, corrupt your data if you're not lucky enough to, to seg fault. Um, pointers are um, genuinely dangerous, and although it's incredibly powerful and great for performance sensitive code, it's also worth being really careful about where in your code base this lives and not letting it sort of spread out over everything. You want this isolated to a, a few critical sections um, where it can make a huge impact, um, but it's also worth being very cautious about having this in a large code base with a bunch of people working on it. Um, so the other thing you need to, we need to actually get libuv running is we need to use the CFFI and declare bindings. So the, again, the thing that's really amazing about Scala native for me is how easy it is to just link to either C standard lib functions or third party C libraries. You literally just have this at extern object and then on line four we just have a def q sort which is just going to have the signature whose types align with the C standard lib qsort function. Um, and then say equals extern. And that, that's literally all, all there is to it. Um, I'm gonna help it out a little bit by declaring a type called comparator because if anyone's used qsort, it basically takes um, an opaque byte array and then it takes a function pointer, um, a C function pointer, uh, for the actual function to use to compare items in it, which is how it sort of abstracts over the structure of, of the array. Um, and the really cool thing that Scala native can do that Go can't and that is really nice is we can pass Scala functions um, into this just like C functions. Um, there's, there's also some limitations on that though. Um, C functions are unlike Scala functions in that they're static, right? They don't have lexical scope. Um, they can access static variables like object members, but they can't access a member of a class, for example. So that, that constrains your design patterns a little bit and you'll see me using objects instead of case classes in a lot of places that might feel a little, little funky, but that's mostly to, to make them work safely with um, with C functions. Um, so for example, if we wanna like declare a, stru a data structure that's uh, like a C style um, like uh, data structure, we can declare it like on line two, this my struct is just uh, basically declared like a tuple. And then we can declare an instance of a comparator um, function, um, which basically works as a single abstract method um, class. The, of course, with Scala 2.12 um, in a month or two for Scala native, the syntax for this will get cleaner and that'll just be a, a lambda, right? Um, but this is how it works in 2.11. Um, and then once we've done that, like if you see on line 15, then you can just call qsort um, and pass it your comparator and it just works. And if anyone wants to see my talk last year for how crazy fast uh, the C standard lib quick sort is. Um, I get really excited about that, but I don't have time to go into it uh, today, unfortunately. So all of this reminds me of a like ancient piece of programmer wisdom, Greenspun's 10th rule, um, which is to say that any sufficiently complicated C or Fortran program contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-ridden and slow implementation of half of common Lisp. <laughs> um, and the way I unpack that is to say that the, the, the techniques I've shown you, these void pointers, function arguments, and casts, they're C affordances for generic programming, but they're also just how you implement a dynamic language in C. Um, and the errors you get when you do this wrong are a lot closer to the kind of errors you get in a Python or a JavaScript function where you just get a field on, a, on an object that isn't there um, or call a function that isn't there. Um, so you don't always have, you don't have the kind of safety Scala normally guarantees you, um, but it, this suffices, right? This is, this is enough to, to make it work and to provide a safe wrapper on top of, of LibUV's API surface. Um, so let's actually get into the, the real implementation now. So um, to start, Scala Native actually already has an execution context that it includes. Um, it's literally just these 22 lines of code. Before I saw Victor's talk yesterday, I would have said this is the smallest one possible, but now I've seen one that's half this size. Um, but the idea is it, it does something a little unusual in that the way it implements the execute uh, method is that it doesn't immediately execute runnables when they're ready to run. Instead, it just appends them onto a queue and defers execution until this private loop method gets invoked. And this is where the Scala native runtime hooks in, and it basically just calls this loop after the main method, after the main function of the class returns, um, and then it just basically 
pulls the queue um, until it's exhausted. And of course, each one of those queue, each one of the runnables on the queue can complete a future, which can spawn more, so it can get repopulated. So maybe it won't get exhausted, or maybe it eventually will. Um, but the, the implementation of future takes care of all that. If you implement your own execution context, you don't worry about dispatching or linking um, or callbacks. You just worry about running the, the runnables that the, the future class gives you. So it's surprising. Surprisingly um, lightweight um, to, to implement one of these. Um, so we're going to use a pr very similar technique to make this work on libuv. Um, the libuv event loop has quite a few different lifecycle hooks uh, that we can attach to. Um, from my experience, the the best time to run these things has been immediately prior to polling for IO. The idea is before we start, do, we stop running our code and start polling for IO. We want to exhaust all work that's available, um, and then we'll just do IO until we have more work um, to do um, effectively. Now, the one catch with that is if you were, if you uh, recall the, the, some of the API slides I showed you in the last section, we have tasks that we can do, like reading from a socket, that aren't represented by a future. Right, so this execution context has to do one extra task. It has to track non-future I/O tasks um, and delay termination of the loop until all I/O is complete and there's no more I/O work it can do, as well as no more futures. That's sort of the one complication you get from sort of from building I/O into to your event loop. Um, and the way we do that is with this um, this loop extension that we briefly saw saw earlier. It's just a trait and it allows any um, either code within the library or third-party library code to register with the event loop that some number of, of IO tasks are going, and it can just sort of check in on this and see, see if there's work being done. Um, it's a really great way to just keep the code really modular rather than have a, a giant class um, that, that sort of models this very large C library. Um, so the way we actually implement this trait, um, we start out with something very, very close to, to the initial code, right? We have a list buffer of runnables. Um, we will get an, an instance of the, the UV default event loop, um, and again, we'll for running our runnables um, until later when um, a callback handle uh, fires. And that, that gets implemented like this, this dispatch step um, callback. Um, and all it does is, again, it just walks through the queue. It runs the tasks that it can. And then the one check is before um, actually stopping, right, um, it checks to see if um, the task queue is empty and no extensions have outstanding work. Then and only then, it'll actually stop the handle, which will allow event, the libuv event loop to terminate. And then our program can, um, can exit. Otherwise, it just goes back through the loop and pulls for more IO and does more work. Um, so all the actual um, interesting work gets implemented as these loop extensions that, that bolt onto it. The whole execution context is, I think it's less than 100 lines of code. All the, the fun stuff is, is in the extensions. Um, and then basically for whenever we add one in, um, we'll just register it with this add extension method. Um, it's really simple. So let's implement the sort of delay timer loop extension now, because yeah, we're really good on time. Um, this is awesome. So the, the, the trick here, um, um, is that the, the timer extends loop extension. Um, active request is just going to be the size of this mutable hash map we're going to keep around. The keys of this hash map um, are going to be longs, and the values are going to be promises. Um, have have people seen the promise class mostly? Um, I think Victor gave a better summary of it than I possibly could. I think what he said is a promise is an obligation to provide a value at some point in the future. It lets us spawn off futures that aren't attached to a runnable, and then it lets our code um, supply values or failures to them uh, whenever we choose. So it's a great way to actually um, implement um, IO and return futures safely. Um, 
And then uh, we'll just have um, two additional methods. We'll have the delay method, which just is what we saw in the public API signature. It takes a duration, returns a future. And then we'll have this um, timer callback function. So the signature of that timer callback function, you can see on line 18, um, it's as simple as it can be. It takes a timer handle, returns a unit, so um, it does almost nothing. Um, but there's also not a lot of arguments you can throw into it. Um, we're going to model the timer handle as a pointer of long, even though this is a large, opaque data structure, right? Um, if you look at the C um, includes, it's got lots of macros and it's different on um, various platforms. So it would really be a pain to model this data structure field by field. Um, to mo treat it just as a pointer long is cool and is sort of what makes this work, and I'll, I'll show you how that works, but it's, um, it's a fun little trick. And then the two C functions we need to call are we need um, timer init and timer start. Um, and um, they do what, what, what they say. Timer init initializes a, a timer handle pointer um, and attaches it to a loop. Um, and then timer start takes a callback and a timeout and optionally a repeat count. Um, and then starts, starts running it um, whenever the event loop is, is ready to go. So um, the, 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 the one dumb trick for opaque structs is that it, it's very often required in C or in Scala Native to work with a data structure without knowing its internal layout. Um, that makes it really hard to allocate or initialize it yourself programmatically, but if the library you're working with gives you helper functions, um, it can often allocate and initialize it for you, so you don't even have to know how many bytes wide um, this thing is. Um, and then there's this amazing C technique called type puns, which allow us to cast data between unrelated types. So um, you can sort of both cast uh, a struct with three fields to sort of a prefix of its fields, and as long as you don't modify or touch the trailing fields, nothing goes wrong, right? And then you can cast like a struct containing a pointer of byte to a struct containing a long because they're the same size. And then that's, here's the really cool one. Uh, a pointer to a one field struct containing a T is equivalent to a pointer containing a T. Um, there's no like padding there. It's all totally static layout. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it, it feels scary and kind of ugly, but it also works and it can be really fast because what we'll do is we're going to use that long um, cell basically to store serial numbers, and that'll allow us to basically keep enough tracking data about which timer instances we've created um, in this mutable hash map, but it'll allow us to avoid having to do an extra dereference and memory load, right, to, to find out the, the, the contents like we would if we had like a larger custom data structure attached there. Um, so once we do that, the delay method works like this. Um, we convert the duration to milliseconds because that's what it wants. We instantiate a promise. We generate a serial number and store the promise in our map. And then on line nine, um, we use malloc to allocate a timer handle. And then we use this helper function libuv gives us, uv handle size, to actually get a correctly sized chunk of data for this for our platform. Um, then we initialize it. And then we, on line 11, we just use um, the dereference operator to assign our timer ID to the timer handle, which feels really scary and destructive, but because it's only going to do an update on the leading eight bytes of this data structure, which ha friend, hap happily for us was designed for us to do this. All of the scary private data fields are the trailing fields, so we can just chop them off. It's really awesome that it works. Um, and then we start the timer and return the future that we spawn off the promise. Um, and then likewise, the actual callback that we pass in to, to, to when this is done is even simpler, right? Um, we get the timer handle back as the sole argument, and then we just dereference it, which gives us back the timer ID we just stored in that, that one leading eight byte field. Um, and then we pull the promise out of our map using um, the timer ID that we just dereferenced, we, we remove the, the, the promise from the map, and then we, we succeed the promise with, uh, with unit. Um, and that's literally all it takes. And then <laughs> this just works. Uh, the first time it, it did, it feel, felt a little magical. Um, but it, this is all it takes. And then you just have a, there's all this scary stuff going on underneath, but you, then you have idiomatic, safe Scala that's just usable. Um, so 
so where, where, where do we go from here? Like I said, um, I'm trying to improve support in Scala native for user supplied event loops to make like the loop.run invocation less intrusive. Um, getting good integration with STDP is a really high priority for me. Um, it's one of my favorite uh, libraries, um, and I think it does a great job at this. Um, Pavel Shizrowski, um already did a great STDP native um, curl binding, actually, for the blocking STDP API. Um, so I'd love to get these consolidated. Um, I'd like to spin out the high-level server API. I think it's great to have something um, now here for now, but in the long run, I don't think like a server DSL belongs like in a core Scala native package. Um, and it makes sense once we have an ecosystem to just spin, spin that out entirely and let the community take it over. And then I really want to get feedback on the design of the streaming um, IO API, not just like design critiques, but really like the, the, the effort and the, the time of, of implementing like Zio and Cat's Effect and stuff on top of this and see if that um, gives us any guidance um, towards sort of the next round of, of iteration on this. Um, all of that said, we would love to have a lot more contributors um, to, to make this work. Um, there's so many low-hanging fruit out there um, for Scala Native, and there's a lot of like weekend-sized projects that can have a really, really huge impact. Um, it's, a, it's a really exciting moment where there's a lot of things that are possible. Um, and like our existing contributor community is amazing and passionate, and they've done phenomenal things. None of this will be possible without them. And um, yeah, if anyone's here and thinks, oh, gee, I could write a better server DSL than that in 45 minutes, please, please do. Come talk to me or just get it out there. Like, get involved. I, we would love to have you. We're, uh, we have a great getter chat. Drop on by. And um, yeah, that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions to our native speaker? Mm-hmm. Oh, I think we got one over there. Hi, I actually have lots of questions, but I <laughs> just raised one. Yeah. You didn't mention garbage collection. Yeah. How does that happen there? So um, ordinary Scala value, so Scala native has a state of the art garbage collector that performs a little bit better than, than Hotspot. Right, um, really nice. And Dennis's paper on that it would be the reference. I'm not an expert on garbage collection, um, but that basically works. Basically, Scala values have been garbage collected. Exactly. Whereas pointers are not. However, pointer the new thing in Scala native 0.4 is that you can actually box a pointer. Right. So the 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 contents of the pointer won't be gar garbage collected, but then you can actually store a pointer as a, key, as a value in a hash map, like I did. Um, so it allows you to sort of mix the domains of unsafe values and, and Scala values in a way that's, it's, it's actually new. It's like, I'm basically rewriting a lot of the book around this technique, um, but it's definitely the, the state of the art. All right, I'll, I'll raise the second question. Yeah, Tasty, do you use it? Because it sounds like a, a good use case for Tasty. Use it where? For compiling. Um, for compiling, um, I know Dennis has um, like an experimental fork of Scala C that runs in Scala Native, um, so that's been that's been that's been demonstrated, but I don't think it's merged yet. Um, I think Scala Format actually does run in Scala Native now, so having like tools like that um, run in Scala Native where you get that really quick startup time is one area of immediate impact, right? Not having to pay the the like Java startup. Obviously, like Jorge's work on Bloop makes it a lot less painful to deal with with S BT and stuff like that for developer tooling, but even just like the lower memory overhead of, um, of Scala Native really makes an impact there. So that's, that's an exciting um, point you. already. Yeah. Is that it? So with no more questions, thank you very much once yeah. again. Thank you so much.